Hey everyone, this is Dan with GraniteIT.net. I'm back again with another FortiGate video. Tonight I would like to talk about the topic of external threat intelligence and how we can ingest that data directly on the FortiGate and use it to extend the capabilities of the device. This feature allows you to implement third-party IP block lists, uh, URL block lists, you can block DNS domain names with DNS filtering, or you can ingest feeds of file hashes to enhance the antivirus detection of the FortiGate. Today, I'm going to use the FortiGate 61F running FortiOS version 7.0.1. However, the external fabric connectors have been accessible on the FortiGate since version 6.2. To get started, we're going to navigate to the Security Fabric External Connectors node. Click Create New and scroll to the bottom of the page. As I mentioned before, there are four categories of block list. Uh, they are all fairly appropriately named uh, IP block lists, domain name block lists, malware hash block lists and URL block lists get ingested as a FortiGuard category feed. They are all set up very similarly in the same spot. However, they get exposed and used slightly differently within the FortiGate UI afterwards. Now it's important to note that if you have VDOMs enabled on your FortiGate, your external connectors will be configured under the global settings, but the policies and profiles that apply them will happen at the per VDOM level. The threat feeds I've selected for this demonstration are freely available and are for demonstration purposes only. You can use them at your own risk, however, I highly recommend that you vet them thoroughly to ensure that they are accurate and current and updated regularly. Tonight's demonstration, we're going to focus on a Talos IP block list from Cisco Talos, a Tor IPs block list from dan.me.uk and the URL house malicious URL block list from abuse.ch. We'll start with the Talos feed. So I'll copy the download URL. And we'll go back to the FortiGate. So we're going to choose the IP feed. I'll give that a name. Paste the URL. We don't need HTTP authentication. And so that we're not abusing Cisco Talos, we'll extend the refresh rate so that we only refresh the feed every 30 minutes. Okay, now let's pull down the URL house feed. URL house offers the feed in several plain text formats. Uh, 
One is a very comprehensive list of everything that they've blocked. The second is only the current URLs found in the last 30 days. And the third is a curated list of URLs that are currently online and active. So I think that's the one we would like. This is an example of what a feed should look like. While we wait for that to download, let's go ahead and set up the Tor IP block list. Copy the URL I've already got open. We don't need authentication. Actually, I will extend that to 35 minutes. Dan.uk or Dan.me.uk are very strict on how frequently you can pull that list down. It's every 30 minutes, but we want to go a little bit beyond that to ensure that we don't run into errors. I'll give that a moment to refresh. And we can hover over each field, or each feed, sorry, to validate how many valid entries have been downloaded. We have our feed set up. But as I mentioned before, the feeds get exposed within the UI and configured and blocked slightly differently. So your IP block lists become accessible through firewall policies as address group objects. Your URL feeds get exposed within web filter profiles under the heading of external categories the domain or DNS domain feeds are accessible from within your DNS filter profiles and your malware hashes actually uh, get enabled in your antivirus filter profiles. So we'll go ahead and create a couple of firewall policies here to block a feed. Typically if you have uh, externally accessible resources you'd want to block these in both directions so that's what we'll do here uh, in my lab environment I don't so it doesn't make a lot of sense other than if I wanted to specifically uh, be able to report or log traffic from a specific feed then I might want to en enable that and just be able to log the number of attempts that each feed is is uh, blocking We select the feed as an address object here. And we'll deny the traffic. We'll log the violation traffic. That's entirely up to you if, if uh, you're comfortable not, not uh, logging. I do like to log especially outbound traffic going to malicious IPs. It allows us to remediate uh, potentially infected systems and whatnot. I'll just clone the reverse of that policy to block the inbound. Mm -hmm. 
I'll fix up my sequence groupings here. If you're not currently using sequence groupings, I find them an extremely helpful tool in organizing my policy list. As I mentioned, your URL categories get exposed through the web filter profile. We're using the par family profile on our default outbound policy. So let's go ahead and edit that. So you can see the URL house category gets set up as a remote category there. So we'll just set that to block. Although we don't have any setup, let's take a quick look at the DNS categories. And this is where you would find your external categories there. And if you had a file hash feed, you would expose those to your antivirus through the profile. And you would enable it here use external malware block list and you could specify all or you could select all or specify an individual feed. And some of you might be saying, well, Dan, why would I use a threat feed to block Tor exit nodes when the FortiGate has the built-in internet service database? And you can certainly do that. You can select the internet service database as a, as a source and you can filter that and you can definitely select Tor exit nodes from this list. The problem that I've run into is in an environment that is IPv6 enabled, the internet service database as maintained by FortiGuard at this time only contains IPv4 addresses. So if you really want to block both IPv4 and IPv6 addresses for Tor exit nodes, you have to use a threat feed. So we'll go ahead and set this policy up for the threat feed address group and save the policy. The next thing I'd like to chat about are possibly a couple of quick use cases for this sort of uh, threat feed ingestion. Um, one would be uh, just to add a bit more protection. Uh, not that FortiGuard isn't doing a fantastic job with the threat data that you're already ingesting uh, through their, their service, but Sometimes it's nice to augment that with uh, somebody else's data as well. Uh, another option is for maybe some in-house processes. So you could generate your own feed files on an internal web server and have the FortiGate feed off of those at a very regular interval. And that would help you in the event that you are in the middle of some sort of incident response and you need to upload some file hashes really quickly to make sure that they're not being uh, transmitted between segmented VLANs. Um, that would really help you to understand where potential infections are coming from, but also to, to prevent that lateral movement of malware throughout your environment. Another possible use case might be if due to corporate policy, you had a list of domains that, although they may not be malicious or uh, really even uh, bad websites, perhaps you've got a corporate policy that just doesn't allow your employees to go there. So you could craft a feed uh, that the FortiGate ingests that you could regularly update. And perhaps it's uh, updated by the IT department, perhaps by an automated script, or maybe even the HR department has a hand in uh, deciding that people can't, uh, can't visit specific websites. I'd like to thank you all for watching this video and invite you to add to the comments below uh, 
Let me know any creative cool ways that you can think of to use an internal threat feed, or if you've got sources of external threat intelligence that you think are particularly great, let me know that as well. Unfortunately, unlike what they say, great minds don't always think alike, but I can learn from you guys uh, as much as I can share what I know. So thanks a lot. And as always, feel free to like and subscribe below.